G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing my redraft series that I've been doing for like the last week or so. Started through the 2022 draft, then 21, 2020 obviously, and then now we are going to have a crack at the 2019 draft. This one was an interesting one, some really good top end talent, uh, but analyzing it a little bit further, it gets pretty difficult after the first 10 or so picks to really decipher who would get redrafted, you know, between 11 and 20 say. So if you're unfamiliar, haven't watched the previous videos, the premise of this video is to redraft this 2019 draft as though it was being redrafted today. Or perhaps more accurately, if clubs went back in time, knowing what they know now, who would they pick? So again, it's not not simply a ranking of the players that were drafted in this. There's also got to be a bit of contemplation of what the projection is for that player because these players, they are getting older, obviously, the further drafts I go back, but you're still projecting to the future. There's still, uh, most of them will have their best football ahead of them. So without further ado, let's crack into redrafting the 2019 draft. So at pick one, we originally had Matthew Rowell, of course, but uh, with Gold Coast having picks one and two, this is a tough one. It's tough to split the first handful of picks, but I've decided to bid on GWS's Tom Green, which will be subsequently matched. Therefore, GWS also have their next pick absorbed as well because Tom Green was originally bid on at pick 10. Uh, he's played 67 games now and had a pretty, I guess you could say, breakout year this year. He was first in the league for disposals per game, 32 per game, and he had six clearances a game as well and ranked number one in the league for contested possessions. So again, it's really tight to try and split you know, the top a handful of picks. I'll tell you exactly who those picks are uh, in a moment, of course. But Tom Green has a massive amount of upside. Huge competitor, physically huge as well. And so I think there's a good chance that he would go close to pick one if this was redrafted. So that puts Gold Coast back on the board with uh, picks two and three. Of course, with this pick originally, they took Matthew Rao outright. I'm going to go with Caleb Sarong from Fremantle, who was originally pick eight to that club. This year, he had a wonderful year, averaged 31 touches a game, came seventh in the Brownlow. He's a top four clearance player in the competition and top five for contested possessions as well. So wins plenty of the footy. He's got a bit of dog about him, which I like, and I honestly think he is... He could easily be pick one if it was redrafted. I think he's that good. Then with their second pick, Gold Coast will... It's tough. There's a few good options, but I've got them taking Noah Anderson once again. Uh, obviously, he went pick two with no Tom Green bid, uh, but he's played 81 games and another player who had a real breakout year this year. Finished eighth in the Brownlow, if I'm not mistaken, averaging about 27 touches a game and was seventh in the league for center clearances as well. So a really hardworking two-way runner. Good output. You feel like he is on an upward trajectory. Not quite as good as a Caleb Sarong or Tom Green, in my opinion, but not far off. Then we've got Melbourne on the board, and just to be boring, uh, I've got them taking who they took in the real draft as well, which is Luke Jackson. So we know Luke Jackson is a high potential key position player. Could he go high? Yeah, but I felt like it was a little bit too hard to slot him in ahead of guys like Sarong, Anderson, and Green. So he falls to the next pick. Again, another player whose upside is enormous and still has a lot of his best football in front of him. But in that time, he's played 75 games. He's a premiership player. I thought he had a pretty productive first season at Fremantle. Averaged 15 touches a game, a goal a game, and 18 hit outs as well playing second ruck. So the upside's there. I don't necessarily think he's like best player in the competition that level of potential, but he still ranks pretty highly. At pick five, the Sydney Swans, they originally took Dylan Stevens with his selection, uh, but if they had their time over, I've got them taking Will Day, who originally went pick 13 to the Hawks, of course, who's played 54 games now, and I think we saw a real uptick in the, the production of Will Day. We've also seen him transition to be a bit more of a midfielder than simply a distributing running half back. but he's uh, moved in the midfield with pretty good effect, averaging about four clearances a game. Still seems to split his time, if I'm not wrong. Plays a bit of defense, but four clearances a game is pretty good going and he goes at 78% efficiency. And I just think the upside that Will Day has elevates him to be about a, pick, a top five pick in this draft. Then you've got the Adelaide Crows who originally took Fisher Mackesy, who is unfortunately now retired. Uh, but this time, if they had the time again, they would be eyeing off Chad Warner from Sydney. Now, Chad Warner is another one that could justifiably go higher. We had a real... Well, he's had a pretty good career at Sydney in general, but last year in 2022, he was a really driving force in that team that made the grand final. He's played 60 games now. Statistically, he actually improved in 2023, but I'm not sure if he had the same impact. He averaged about 25 touches a game. So 2022, he hit the scoreboard more. I think he's probably slightly regressed, at least from the outside looking in, but it's pretty thin margins between someone like a Noah Anderson, a Caleb Sarong, and a Chad Warner. I mean, it's some really, really good top-end midfield talent in this draft. At pick seven, uh, once again, continuing with the theme of of clubs picking the same player again. I've got Fremantle picking Hayden Young. This is the same pick as it actually went down in real life. 
He's played 57 games now. I would argue he had a pretty good breakout season. Um, you know, primarily as a defender, but he's also showed a bit of a transition into the midfield now. Average about 22 uh, touches a game. And uh, we know that powerful boot he's got. His, his kicking is one of his biggest weapons. So I think uh, Hayden Young is on an upward trajectory. He could, you know, slide into the top five as his career goes on. But right now, that's about right, I'd say. With Fremantle's second selection in a row, uh, they took Caleb Song originally, not available now, but they've got the number one pick originally in Matthew Rao. Now, this one might be a little bit divisive. I know Matthew Rao really has his fans, and he's still a bloody good player. So, you know, he was obviously pick one originally after 62 games in which we saw, you know, an amazing start to his career, and then he had a few injuries, and that really sort of stalled his development. What he does do well is he's, well, he's actually the top tackler in the league this year. He's second in the league for clearances and he averages about 21 touches a game. So I'd argue the things working against Matthew Rowe is just a little bit of lack of balance. I don't think his midfield game is as balanced as some of the players that have listed ahead of him. Namely, very inside dominant, lots of clearances, lots of tackles, doesn't really accumulate on the outside, doesn't really impact um, in transition, etc. So for that reason, Matthew Rouse slides a little bit, but you could imagine he'd go higher if it was redrafted because he does have that potential. At pick nine, uh, Carlton on the board, they originally uh, bid on Liam Henry, which Fremantle match, which is why Fremantle don't actually have a third pick in a row in this scenario. Um, and then in real life after that, they traded their live pick to the Gold Coast Suns for Flanders. But the way I'm doing this is the original draft order. As best as I can, the more trades there are, the messier this gets. But Carlton, assuming they don't trade their pick in this scenario, uh, will take Cozzy Pickett. You'd imagine they wouldn't trade that pick if Cozzy Pickett is available, you know, if it was redrafted now. Uh, Pickett's had a really good start to his career as a small forward. Um, in his last three seasons, his tallies are 40 goals, 41, 37. The consistency is there. Uh, that equals 125 goals from 85 games. He was also ranked first in the league for tackles inside 50 this year. So a balance between hitting the scoreboard and tackling pressure inside 50. He could realistically go higher in a redraft. It's just that I feel like the top eight are very strong. At pick 10, having missed out on Cozzy Pickett, who they originally took with this selection, we have Melbourne taking Lockie Ash, who originally uh, went at pick, I want to say four. That was the one that I didn't write down. Sorry, he went to the GWS Giants with a very early pick, um, and now he has ended up at Melbourne. But Ash has been a very consistent best 22 player for the Giants in that back six. He averaged about 24 touches a game, lots of rebound, really good foot skills. He's fallen down the order a little bit by comparison to some of the midfielders that have uh, you know, played well over the last few seasons. But from a best available point of view, I think Lockie Ash is a really good pick here. Then we've got Hawthorne at pick 11. This pick was originally Will Day, who is, of course, unavailable. I'm going to pluck a toll here in Sam DeConing. Sam DeConing really made a name for himself last year as a key defender, really athletic one, um, who obviously is a premiership player now, having played 43 games for the Cats. Ranks 10th in intercepts last year. Originally when I picked 19, I think, you know, a key position prospect that's showing some talent is a good chance to go, you know, somewhere in the first round. So I'm a little bit murky. I feel like this is where the draft starts to get a little bit even, but this is where I put De Koning. At pick 12, we have Port Adelaide on the board. And instead of Miles Bergman, who they originally took, I've got them taking Trent Rivers from the Melbourne Footy Club, who was originally pick 32. Um, from East Fremantle. He's played 77 games, another premiership player in his second season, just like Jackson and Pickett. And he played 25 games this year, 20 touches a game, four rebound 50s. It was somewhat of a breakout year, but I think Rivers has always been a pretty good player. So I think this is about the right range as a halfback flanker. Didn't elevate him ahead of some of the more, you know, either key position or midfield positions, but Trent Rivers certainly improved on that pick 32 position. At pick 13, I've got the Western Bulldogs. Their original pick was Cody Waitman. I think I'm going to go with that again, to be honest. Cody Waitman has proven to be a very good small forward of the competition. In his first 59 games, he's kicked 99 goals, and including 34 from 19 this year, which is pretty solid numbers for a small forward. So I think on output, Cody Waitman, that's a fairly justifiable pick. And uh, on talent, he's right up there. At pick 14, Geelong are going to bid on Kitty Coleman. And Kitty Coleman will join the Brisbane Lions through their academy. Originally, the bid came from him at pick 36 from Essendon, but we've seen him play 64 games at AFL level. I feel like in the last two seasons, we've seen a real elevation in his game as a running defender who distributes by foot really well. And if you didn't know much about Kitty Coleman, I'm sure you watched the grand final and he was arguably one of the best players on the field. I'd say probably second best player on the field. I don't know. My memory's failing me, but he was probably the Brisbane Lions best player for sure. Therefore, teams wanting a uh, elite distributor from the back half. I think Coleman has a stack of potential and he's really improved on his draft position. At selection 15, we have Geelong on the board. 
board. They originally took Cooper Stevens, and this time they're going to take Sam Flanders. Sam Flanders was originally taken at pick 11 after Gold Coast traded up for him. Now, Sam Flanders is an interesting one. I think there was injuries there for a while, but he uh, has taken a little bit longer to come on. He's played 42 games now, but I think we saw a real breakout half a season from him this year. Good preseason, and then sort of from round 15 onwards, he kind of exploded, averaging about 25 disposals a game. So I think the upside is there. I think Flanders has proven himself to be perhaps a little bit of a late bloomer in this draft, and you could see him rising up the rankings a little bit. On exposed form, he doesn't have quite you know the, the reputation of the players ahead of him, but pick 15 to do long, I'm happy with. At pick 16, I've got the Gold Coast Suns. Now, um, this might be confusing because obviously Carlton actually had the selection and they took Brody Kemp, but Gold Coast and the Carlton traded live and I've kind of eliminated the live trades. So assuming Gold Coast still have this pick, I'm going to take Miles Bergman. He originally went pick 14 to Port Adelaide, so around about the same range. He played 57 games and established himself as a, a good, strong, reliable defender in that Port Adelaide back six. Then Port Adelaide's on the board, originally taking Mitch Georgiatis. Uh, this time they're going to take Liam Henry. Now, under these rules, if we're redrafting it today, the next generation academy rules have changed, which means Fremantle can't match a bid here. So, I mean, there's no point getting salty. It doesn't impact the video at all. It just means that Port Adelaide are going to take Liam Henry here after he was originally bid on at pick nine from Carlton. Now, he's played 43 games. We saw him have a bit of a breakout year this year as a wingman with, um, you know, pretty good foot skills into the forward 50, averaged about 20 and a half disposals, but he had multiple games of 30 plus as well. So you feel like he's on an upward trajectory and uh, probably justifiably another first round pick. Then Geelong's on the clock with uh, pick 18, and they originally took Sam DeConing, who's obviously off the board now, and I've got, actually got them taking Jake Riccardi, who went at pick 51 to GWS. Now, I think Jake Riccardi sort of made him a name for himself for the last couple of years. Then he dipped in form, and he's played about 50 games now, but this year he actually put together a pretty solid um, season of form as a uh, key forward, kicking 35 goals from 21 games. Was drafted as a mature ager, so has a little bit of a developmental advantage. But on the logic that key forwards who hit the scoreboard are at least best 22 players, there's a little bit of a premium on them. So I think Jake Riccardi would go somewhat high in this draft. Then Port Adelaide's back on the board. Again, there was a live trade with Carlton here where Carlton actually took Sam Philp with his pick. But if we're eliminating live trades, let's just assume it's Port Adelaide. And uh, they're going to take their own boy in Mitch Georgiatis, who uh, has only slid a couple of spots. But uh, Georgiatis has kind of fallen off the radar a little bit after a pretty exciting start to his career. Uh, he's played 49 games now, just the two this year, obviously coming off an ACL. So I give him a little bit of leeway there. But between 21 and 22, he uh, kicked 55 goals from 40 games. And I do think there's genuine upside there, enough for him to get picked in the first you know, 20 picks if it was redrafted again. Okay, now with the final pick, we have the Richmond Football Club. And this one is tough. There was, I'll, I'll name the players who missed out after this, but I've gone with Devin Robertson, who originally went pick 22 to the Brisbane Lions. He's played 41 games now, but, you know, while his stats don't really indicate much, he, he played 16 games and is essentially best 22 at the team that made the grand final this year. Again, modest stats, but he's kind of playing as a defensive forward slash midfielder as well. So he's not getting a lot of the ball, but he's playing a role. And I think he's probably just slightly edged a lot of players that just missed out. So I'll name the ones that I really wanted to um, include. Dylan Williams might have been the next cab off the rank. There's also Dylan Stevens, who went pick five for the Sydney Swans. Josh Worrell has become a best 22 player at Adelaide. A little bit harder to assess that one. There's Ryan Burns. Even Sean Maker at times has looked really good, but kind of fallen away. So Devin Robertson on a little bit of recency bias, but playing in a team that is a, a very good team at that and being a somewhat established best 22 player, he sneaks in. So Richmond get a good player in Devin Robertson. All right, that wraps up my take on the top 20 guys. These, these are tough. These are tough. You'd think it's easy. Um, I feel like the first eight on, on some are easy. Sometimes it's the first 12. Then it becomes really even and subjective. So I, I look forward to your input in the comments. What could I have done differently? Um, but again, it's pretty even. So as always, I look forward to your opinions and uh, I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.